No intro tonight. No big fancy thing. It's Friday. I can't wait to see you. Hi, I'm Dan Haggerty. How was your week? Uh, you know, that's not rhetorical. I actually want to know. Reach out. Facebook, Instagram. You can email us at the story at KGW.com or use Twitter as always in the hashtag HeyDan. We're going to answer some questions throughout the show. I'm going to read a few at the very end, but in the meantime, let's get to it. All right, our big story tonight is all about the race for Oregon's 4th Congressional District. It's always been a pretty safe seat for Democrats, um, to say the least, but it's become a lot more competitive, I think, than anyone expected. It's a pretty big area. You know, it covers Corvallis, Eugene, and Roseburg, half the coast, all the way down to the California border. Congressman Peter DeFazio has represented it since 1987. That is 33 years. I'm sure you're familiar with him. You should be after all of this time. He's the chair of the House Transportation Committee, which is a pretty powerful position. He's never really faced a serious challenger until now. Enter Alex Scarlatos, who's become I don't know, a bit of a celebrity as a former Army National Guard soldier who helped stop a terrorist attack on a train to Paris in 2015, a worldwide event and story. Then he went on Dancing with the Stars and finished third, so the guy can dance. And then he starred as himself in a Clint Eastwood movie called The 1517 to Paris about that terrorist attack he helped stop. Now, like I said, this is usually a pretty safe seat for DeFazio to maintain, but analysts have recently moved this race from likely Democratic to lean Democratic. And you can tell how competitive things have been just by turning on the TV. DeFazio left us behind a long time ago. If Alex Scarlatos won't support hardworking people in a time of crisis, why should hardworking people support him? DeFazio doesn't answer to you. He answers to Nancy Pelosi and the socialists that have taken over the Democratic Party. Alex Carlottos, fine for Dancing with the Stars, not fit for Congress. All right, with all those attack ads, this has made it into the most expensive congressional race ever in the state of Oregon. Scarlatos has raised about four and a half million dollars and spent almost all of it. That's more than DeFazio, who's raised about 3.7 million and spent almost 3 million. Now, Laurel Porter talked to both candidates this week on Straight Talk. She started by asking Scarlatos a pretty simple question, why he's running in the first place. DeFazio was doing a good job. I wouldn't be running for Congress. I mean, at the end of the day, he's had 34 years to affect change in Oregon's fourth congressional district. And as a result, we are the poorest congressional district in the state, have incredibly high homelessness rates. In fact, Eugene uh, City Limits has the highest homelessness rate per capita in the country. And of course, um, I mean, we even have high child abuse rates and uh, unemployment rates and our forest management is abysmal. Now, Scarlatos has gotten endorsements from some big names. You'll recognize them. Senator Ted Cruz, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. He's also been accused of hanging out, though, with far-right extremist groups. Now, Salon and Newsweek both ran stories this week about Scarlatos attending rallies that included members of the Proud Boys and posing for a photo with a sign that had a QAnon slogan. Here's what he said, though, when Laurel Porter asked him about that. To clear things up for voters, for the record, will you disavow the Proud Boys, a far-right group with a history of violent confrontations? Uh, I mean, I disavow any group of violent <laughs> confrontations. I disavow the Proud Boys. I disavow Antifa. I mean, I would challenge Peter DeFazio to do the same. Anchored, that article was written because I attended a Timber Unity rally. That's an anti cap and trade movement here in the state of Oregon. It has nothing to do with QAnon or the Proud Boys or any kind of white supremacy organization. So you disavow the Proud Boys specifically? Yes, and, and all the ones I mentioned. Oh, let me ask you about QAnon then, because Newsweek and Salon also reported you shared a photo on Facebook in June that showed you in a photo with people holding an American flag with a phrase associated with group QAnon on it. Will you disavow QAnon and its baseless conspiracy theories? Again, I already did, um, but yes, um, I was again attending the Timber Unity Rally, which was an anti cap and trade movement. I took photos with many people there, some of whom had QNN phrases on their signs, um, but again, I'm not part of that movement. All right. Let's hear from DeFazio now. Now, he's well aware that this district that he has been in charge of for so long is a mismatch of red and blue areas, and he knows his challenger is somewhat of a rising star in the Republican Party. It is a, a very competitive race. My district is uh, purple at best. Uh, and, uh, you know, partisan attitudes have hardened. Uh, you know, I ran, Hillary only won by 552 votes. I won by uh, tens of thousands. But partisan attitudes have hardened since then. 
so I'm not getting uh, as many uh, crossover Republicans. So it's, it's a tough race. Uh, obviously, I'll do very well with Democrats. Uh, we are working very hard on independents and uh, some moderate Republicans. Now, despite his moderate district, the purple district he described, DeFazio hasn't really been afraid at all to back and be behind progressive policies and to go after the Trump administration. You might remember this video from him during all the controversy over the Postal Service this summer. They're not getting this one. All right, on Straight Talk, he defended his liberal record, saying that he's doing what his district needs, especially when it comes to climate change. Your opponent has attacked you for supporting the Green New Deal, a sweeping plan to cut fossil fuel emissions that an opposition ad claims could kill the timber industry. What's your message to your constituents in Oregon timber country? Uh, the Green New Deal was hortatory language. I've applied it in my infrastructure bill, which will create uh, millions of jobs and move us away from fossil fuels. I happen to believe climate change is an existential threat to the future of the planet. And these wildfires we had this last year, those weren't natural. They're not normal. Uh, what, you know, the towns of Talent and Phoenix burned, they're not even forested. The Mackenzie River Corridor has never had a stand replacement fire in history or prehistory. You know, hurricane force wind, 6% humidity, this is driven by climate change. Record dryness, driven by climate change. So we have to deal with climate change. And my infrastructure bill does that, but it also creates uh, millions of jobs. Now, as you can tell, this segment of the story was brought to you by Laurel Porter. Uh, look, she talked to both these candidates about a lot of things, the pandemic, health care. You can watch the entire interview, and, and few people in this business can do this kind of thing better than Laurel can. It's on Straight Talk, coming up tonight at 7 o'clock. Now, in honor of Oregon's 4th Congressional District, let's check in on some of the voter turnout in southwest Oregon. Starting in Lane County, home of the University of Oregon, more than 169,000 return ballots. Douglas County, home of Alex Scarlatos, and home to more than 51,000 return ballots. Lynn County, 54,000 ballots back. Benton County, where we find Corvallis and OSU, nearly 42,000. Coos County, almost 29,000 ballots returned. Curry County, which has been really just killing it as far as percentages are concerned. More than 12,000 votes returned. And finally, Josephine County with more than 37,000 votes back in. Oregon statewide surpassing that 60% turnout mark just today with more than 1.8 million votes. And because we can't really say it enough, if you haven't voted yet in Oregon, do not put your ballot in the mail at this point. It's too late to mail it in. Uh, so if you want to guarantee that it gets there on time, drop it in one of those official Dropbox locations only. Okay. Uh, Washington voters, the rules are a little bit different for you guys. You can still mail your ballot all the way up to Election Day as long as it is postmarked on November 3rd. This is very important if you want your vote to count. And I got this funny feeling that you do. All right, let's talk about another big, big number, 130,000. That's how many students in Oregon should be allowed to go back to in-person classes under a new set of COVID-19 metrics that Governor Brown laid out today. And while it may sound like a pretty big number, 130,000 kids, you got to consider the fact that Portland, Beaverton, Hillsboro, they contain nearly that many students by themselves. What I'm saying really is that most students are going to stay in remote learning. And that brings us to our quote of the day from Governor Brown's announcement today. COVID is here to stay. It's here to stay for the foreseeable future. Or in other words, I think we can all agree this has been much harder than any of us anticipated. We have all the guidelines for you on this on KGW.com, but just to give you kind of the basic idea of the changes here, in order for a county to go back to in-person classes, the county needs to demonstrate fewer than 50 cases per 100,000 people over a two-week period, or fewer than 30 per 100,000 in smaller counties. Counties also need to get their positivity rate below 5%, and this really already rules out Multnomah, Washington, Marion counties, along with a bunch of other ones. We got a full list of, of who made the cut, and who did it on KGW.com. Now, I don't expect everybody to catch every night of the story. Actually, I do, but it's okay if you don't. But if you didn't see our Wednesday episode, you're going to need a little bit of, of context to understand this next story fully. See, basically, the Lincoln County School District is charging fire victims a $2,000 new construction tax to rebuild the homes that burned down 
even though, keep this in mind, other counties have waived it under these similar circumstances. Now, Lincoln County says that they want to do the same. They wish they could, but they're unable to. Now, we were going to have Kyla Boshi back on tonight to answer a lot of questions. We've been getting so many questions uh, from all of you about this story. But, you know, it is a pretty outrageous one when you, when you think about it. But then Kyle heard back from the county. And if you're hoping the next part is going to be a happy ending, well, just watch. The Lincoln County School District is doubling down on its position to tax wildfire victims looking to rebuild. It's not budging and claims other districts break the law by providing a waiver. That means neighbors like John Parrott will have to pay a $2,000 new construction tax, even though he and his family are simply replacing their Otis home lost in the Echo Mountain fire. And I'm living in the trailer. It's going to be 33 degrees tonight. They need to come out here and help us, not be charging people. You know, my insurance was only going to cover about two thirds of what I had. Okay, and I had to fight for that. And they want to get $2,000 out of me on top of that. You know, it's ridiculous. The Lincoln County School District claims its hands are tied. Board members have said repeatedly and publicly they want to help, but can't. State law allows districts to charge a construction excise tax if they choose. The tax money helps accommodate growth so districts can pay for larger classrooms and improved buildings. Lincoln County Superintendent Karen Gray says she's been advised by State Representative David Gomberg districts do not have the discretion to waive the tax based on his conversations with legislative council. But others disagree, including a former state senator who helped write the law in 2007. Yeah, I'd just be really disappointed and surprised if they charged the wildfire victim that's trying to rebuild this fee um, because it'd be relatively easy for them not to do it. Our investigation found other school districts provide waivers. The North Santa Am School District waived its construction taxes for wildfire victims with a simple vote. You know, it certainly can be done. Any, any district can waive it. In a statement, Lincoln County Superintendent said, we are 100 percent for getting exceptions due to natural hazards and stand ready to do that, but we cannot until we get legal permission to do so. The board cannot be asked to break the law even if other districts do so. Representative Gomberg is drafting legislation to help clear up confusion, allowing districts to waive construction taxes for disaster victims retroactively. But there's no guarantee when or if it will pass. If they're trying to rebuild their lives like me and Ashley are over there, then they need to help us. For wildfire victims, there's no time to wait. They need help now. Everything's gone. The only thing left on my property was sheet metal. Kyle Aboshi, KGW News. Hey, real quick before we go to break, we work very hard every night to make sure that everything we say in this show is 100% true. And if we ever fail in that regard, we will be the first to let you know, which is why we need to tell you right now that we uh, ran a story on Wednesday about the backlog of criminal cases in Multnomah County due to COVID. And in the piece, our Pat Doris said arraignments are being delayed by two months after someone is arrested. And we have learned that that statement kind of missed some important context that we want to get straight for you guys. So in custody arraignments, that's where a defendant is still being held in jail, those are happening in the normal time frame, and that's usually within a day or so after the arrest, according to court administrators. It's the so-called out-of-custody arraignments that are being delayed, so not every case is the same as our story originally said. When the story continues, facing down a cold winter, why there may not be enough warm shelter space to go around for people without homes. And a viewer asked us to pass along some helpful voting information, and uh, we didn't we were busy. But they asked again, and again, and again. And well, let's just say, Terrell, I hope you're watching tonight. Haggerty had this kind of interesting exchange with a viewer named Terrell or, or, or Tyrell. I'm going I'm to share that with you in just a minute. In the meantime, keep using that hashtag, hey Dan. Now, I, uh, I know you're probably all pulled out at this point. We're just a few days before Election Day, but I do want to share one more before the weekend. OPB and DHN, they asked Portlanders what they thought the most important problem was facing the city. And overwhelmingly, they said homelessness over COVID, over racism, over protests, over lack of jobs. Homelessness was number one. And with that in mind, we got a warning from our leaders late today. They admitted that they're really scared for this winter because for the first time 
ever, they may have to turn people without homes away from shelters, back into the freezing cold. I talk more about this with Maggie Vespa. Listen here. Okay, Maggie Vespa joining us now. Let's let's dive into this news conference a little bit. And what was said is really dire. And, and to speak frankly, I mean, there have been moments where people have died in the elements in our city on the streets before. And now we're looking at the number of severe weather beds that people rely on being cut in half. Yeah, exactly. I mean, everyone knows people in Portland you know, probably remember, may remember um, us talking every year about the severe weather shelter system, uh, places like Imago Day Church and other big kind of open community spaces, they basically signed up to transform into short-term shelters when temperatures drop below freezing and people need to get inside. Well, now officials say the pandemic and COVID restrictions, social distancing, have made some spaces that they've used in the past unusable. And more importantly, it's slashed the number of people who can be inside any given space. So traditionally, they've started each winter with 300 severe weather beds, and they have about half that with no new prospects for shelter sites. So here's some of what was said in that press conference today. Another way, as it stands right now, because of COVID-19, we cannot guarantee that everyone who needs it will have a shelter on the worst nights of the year. We can use any kind of large open space, a gymnasium, a cafeteria, a large meeting hall, a ballroom, or even a concept floor, even a even floor of offices. Okay, so that's kind of what they're looking for. And by the way, for those screaming at their TV right now about sort of sites that seem like good candidates, like, for instance, the former Wapato Jail and the Oregon Convention Center, even Veterans Memorial Coliseum, I asked about those. Wapato, which is now the Bybee Lakes Hope Center, is opening now as a longer term shelter with its own COVID limits. Plus, it's far from downtown, which officials say is a problem in ice and snow. So under these circumstances, the convention center owned by Metro is actually a no go for now because a spokesperson told me they still have clients who have contracts for events there and it's up to those clients to cancel. So they can't promise that as a shelter. Kind of a similar story for the Coliseum. It's owned by the city, but it's run by outside management. They have a contract, and so they can't offer that as a shelter right now either. And, you know, all that said, those are really central locations, and officials really want to spread it out. They want sites kind of like in East County and in Gresham. They've always tried to put these near where people are actually camping, and they say, Dan, right now, they just don't have enough space. Uh, This whole thing just sounds like a really bad situation. And it's something, you know, just to let people know that's never really happened before. I mean, typically going into winter, the motto with the city and the county is that no one is going to be turned away. But under these circumstances, they may actually have to turn people down when it comes to shelter that could save their lives. Exactly. I mean, it was a really huge statement. So here's the info that they kind of wanted us to point out. If you know of a building that can be used as a shelter site this winter, email the Joint Office of Homeless Services. That address is there on your screen. It's J-O-H-S at moldco.us. And then there's also information there, two different websites about where you can go if you want to volunteer to run one of those shelter sites, which they also need more volunteers. And then also where you can go if you want to donate items that homeless people need during the winter, like coats, boots, socks, all of that. Uh, We'll also have all of that information at kgw.com. So just a lot of need out there and I uh, wanted to help get that info out. You said it, Maggie. Thank you. All right, let's get to that viewer message I mentioned a little earlier. This was a little bit different, so please kind of bear with me as I read through it. On Tuesday, I got this message from Terrell or, or Tyrell Sweetman. Please mention the libraries as being a place to drop off your ballot. Thank you, Terrell. To which I replied, we'll do, thanks. But We didn't. All right, sometimes that's the way it goes. So on Wednesday, the very next day, she messaged me again. Hey, Dan, I waited, and I hoped you were going to announce the drop boxes that are at all the Multnomah County libraries. You see the one exclamation point. She's starting to get a little little irritated. This is super important for people to know about. I hope you announce this tomorrow on your show. Thank you. Again, we did not. And again, in my inbox. I hate to be a broken record, but... I'd so appreciate if you'd announce that people can drop off their ballots at any Multnomah County Library branch or Central Library. I'm screaming now because of the two exclamation points. 
This is such a great service to the public at large. And I know a lot of people don't know about this. Please announce this Friday. I was hoping you were going to announce it tonight. You did say several nights ago that you'd announce this. I hope you do. Thank you. Terrell, parentheses, Anne, if you're afraid to try and pronounce my first name, now you tell me. So, Terrell, Tyrell, Tyrell, Anne, whatever you prefer. Third time's the charm. Sorry it took so long. Sometimes persistence uh, pays off, so thank you for that. Kristen Severance looked at how libraries can be Dropbox locations. All right, this one is for you, Anne. Actually, we got so many emails about this. So we set out to answer, can you drop your ballot in a library book drop? We're not talking about an official drop box located in front of or near the library, but the book return drop off, the slot where you return your books. Counties could designate their library book drop off as an official ballot drop off site this year. But out of the 14 counties in Oregon and Washington that we called, only one did. So let's show you the list here. Clackamas County is in the no column. Multnomah County, yes, you can drop off your ballot in the same place where you return your books at the library. Washington County is no. Everywhere else we called Yamhill, Lynn, uh, Marion, and Polk counties, they all told us no. You cannot return your ballots in the book drop off site. We also reached out to a few more counties here Hood River, Columbia, Clatsop. Lincoln and Tillamook, they are all in the no category here. And two more counties we reached out to in Washington, Cowlitz County and Clark County, they're also no's. Again, many of these places have official ballot drop boxes in front of the libraries or near the libraries, definitely use those. And in Multnomah County, you can put your ballot in the actual book return slot but only in Multnomah County. The elections office says this change came about to expand access to voting during the COVID-19 pandemic. Do you have a question for us related to the election, to voting? Let us know. We love trying to find you an answer. Just use the hashtag, hey Dan. All right, hope that cleared things up. Hashtag, hey Ann. We're gonna read some more comments after the break. Maybe not as long as Ann's or Terrell's. But who knows? I mean, it's Friday. Anything can happen. Grab your phone. Use that hashtag. Hey, Dan. Email the story at KGW.com. We're going to finish things up next. Turning the clocks back on Sunday. Yes, we are. That has not changed, at least not yet. I know it's in the works, but for now, it, it stays. Good luck with that. I don't like it either. Um, let's get to some questions here, some comments. Uh, going back to the tight race that's happening in southwest uh, Oregon right now between DeFazio and Scarlatos. And somebody said, why wasn't DeFazio asked what groups he would denounce? Well, the reason was he wasn't in any pictures uh, or an article wasn't written about him and having a potential kind of co-op with uh, with Antifa or any other group, but Scarlatos was. So when Laurel asks a question like that, or any journalist here at KGW, those aren't accusatory questions. Those are questions about something that is already out there, stories that are already being published, told, shared, discussed, and we give a candidate the opportunity to clear the air, which he had ample opportunity to do so. I recommend at 7 o'clock you watch all of her work on, uh, on, on uh, Straight Talk. Whew, Laurel's standing right over there. I almost forgot the name of the show. Um, and then uh, Steve Cook writing in costume. Hey, Dan, that's a cool Halloween costume, dude. You look just like a news anchor. Steve, I, I thought I had them all fooled. Thanks for being with us. Happy Halloween, everybody. That's the story. I'll see you next week.